So, if you want to read along with me, we're going to be reading chapter 11, verse 1, and going all the way through chapter 13, all the way to the end, 11, 12, and 13, three chapters, a lot to cover, I know, but uh, this isn't your first time reading the Bible, so probably you've read Mark before, and so we'll read this, and then we'll Watch the video, and then we'll have a, a discussion with some of these items. The only thing I'll draw your attention to before we begin is basically, again, this is the Gospel of Mark. The goal of the Gospel of Mark really is all the Gospels, but particularly Mark, because it sets it up at the very beginning, is to, for us to believe the Gospel of Jesus Christ, that He is the Son of God. That's what He tells us. We are now entering into the third section of the book of Mark, okay? Uh, the third section is what happens in and around Jerusalem. We have been in, in and around Galilee, and that's where the center part of the book is about. And now we're entering into the last part of the book of Mark, which deals particularly with events in and around Jerusalem. So, that's how this chapter starts. First one, if you're following. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found the coat outside in the street, tied in the doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that coat? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches as they had cut in the fields. They, those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So this the scripture you know. 10. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest of heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next section is Jesus curses the fig tree, goes to the temple, verse 12. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in a leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. And he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him uh, say, On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, it, is it not written, my house should be called a house of prayer for all nations, that you have made it a den of robbers? The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself in the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. This is now 
the authority uh, in question. It says, verse 27, they arrived again in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders to him, by what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you authority to do this? Jesus replied, I'll ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask them, why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, they feared the people, for everyone held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Jesus said, neither will I tell you, but what authority I'm doing these things. Now we're looking at the parable of the tenants in chapter 12, verse 1. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. They seized him, beat him sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others, some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to, to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him. The inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone that uh, excuse me, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this. Marvelous in our eyes. Verse 12. And the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd. So they left him and went away. Now we're talking about the tax of Caesar. Verse 13. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus is their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose image is is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. They were amazed at him. Now we're on uh, resurrection, verse 18. Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man should, a man's brother die and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry a widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Verse 20. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married a widow, but he also died leaving no child. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the burning bush how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Abraham.
God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. And now in the greatest commandment, verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one, and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. From then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. All right, now we're talking about Jesus asking him questions. Verse 35. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, What did the teacher of the law say that the Messiah, no, excuse me, why did the teacher of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? The large crowd listened to him with delight. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offering were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything. All she had to live. Chapter 13. The destruction of the temple. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite to the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. The gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking in the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, 
Let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the house up go down or into the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their clothes. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter because those will be days of distress unequal from the beginning when God created the world until now and never be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. And that time, if any, at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear, perform signs and wonders to see, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard, I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. Heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. He will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word, words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, Where, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or at dawn, he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Oh, this works.
then once you get to the city, everything changes. And Jesus does the most amazing thing in history. because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. Okay, so it's, it's total fear, total jealousy, like he is taking all of our followers, no one is following us anymore, everyone's astonished at his teaching, we need to kill him. And so then Jesus goes on and he starts telling these parables that are about the, the, the Pharisees, and it even says they knew it, it says they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived he had told the parable against them. Later on, it says that he confronts the Sadducees, and it says, is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. So he's just attacking, attacking, attacking. And then he says this about the scribes. He tells people, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like meetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor and feast, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. So he is telling them they are going to be punished at the end. They're going to be condemned at the end. He's telling the people, don't follow these people. What they are doing is wrong. They actually want all the acceptance, all the praises in the marketplaces. But as he goes on and describes end time events to them, he says, actually, being a part of the kingdom of God is really like being the opposite of these Pharisees and Sadducees and these scribes who love all the honor. But he explains that, listen closely to this, because this is what Jesus says right before he heads to the cross. He says, but be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. I don't know how anyone can read the words of Jesus over and over and over again and believe that God's desire for us here on the earth is to be healthy and wealthy and prosper. His, his, his gospel was one of suffering. He made it so clear. And he tells his disciples, I'm not promising you an easy life. I'm promising you the opposite. You are going to be beat up. You are going to be hated. And it wasn't just that he said this and taught this, but then he lives it out because it's after this that they see him being tortured. Then and they have nailed him to the cross. He exemplifies everything he says there and says, but you need to endure to the end. And he who endures to the end will be saved. Do you understand? This is what he has called us to. The disciples saw the treatment of their Savior. And they remember his words. Look, if you're going to follow me, you're going to face the same persecution that I endured. You're going to be betrayed by family members. You're going to be hated. I mean, do you understand that when you decided to follow Jesus, you were saying, you know what, I will endure anything for his name. And I will make it to the end and be saved because it's not about this life. See, Jesus went into this time knowing that this was going to be the last week of his life. 
but this is what he came down to do. Earlier he told his disciples, look, if you're going to try to save your life, you're going to lose it. Jesus came to give his life, and he knew what was coming after. And do you understand, there's no point to us saving our lives. That is not what Jesus has called us to. He's called us to a life of difficulty, but we endure it because we so believe in what he promised. What he promises is coming after this. Have you truly made that decision to follow him through anything? Or are you one of those that just believes, oh, I'm just going to pray, ask him to come into my heart? You know, it's much more costly than that. He says, give me your life, follow me to the end, and it's all going to be worth it. It's 
just another country. You can be a Christian here, or you can be a heathen here. It doesn't make you a Christian to live in a nation like this. Okay, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you made it a den of thieves. When was that said last? Anybody remember who said that last? It's in, in the book of Jeremiah, right? That's where this is coined, right? And what is happening there? What happens after Jeremiah? Come on, y'all know the history? What happens to Israel? Yes? Captivity. They destroy the temple. The temple's burned to the ground along with whatever's in it. And they are taken away captive into Babylonia. What happened to this great idea of Israel becoming something? They weren't, they weren't all that in a box of chocolate. They were just people too. And they went off the rails. Okay. I do love this uh, thing about prayer. I love, I love that. Uh, there's a couple of things I want to point out. Verses 22 through 25. Uh, someone pointed this out once upon a time. And I always thought it was good. Uh, if you really want to demonstrate faith. You say it. You talk it up what you believe God's going to do. So you say it. Then you believe it. Don't just say it. But believe it. This is what I believe God's going to do. And then you pray about it. I think that's a good order. That is the order of the text. One of the things I, I've noticed people miss is verse 25 of chapter 11. If you pick up on that, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you. This idea of unless they apologize to me, I, I don't have to forgive them. You can live like that, but this text clearly indicates you can also live like this and just let it go. All right, uh, and then uh, obviously this whole thing about authority, what is that ultimately about? Why, why are they checking him on authority? Who gave you this authority? What's the significance? Come on, so their authority is being challenged. Exactly. They are being threatened, they believe. Is he threatening them? In a way, spiritually, he has no desire to threaten them physically. Jesus has no desire to pull down Israel. That's going to be done. He's not doing that right now. That's not what's happening. They think that's what's happening. That's why they're scared of it. They think uh, if he gets on the throne, well, either he, even if he beats Rome, we're out. I mean, you know, he's not going to beat Rome. But even if you were able to beat Rome, we're out of the job. We're done. So that's, that's where their mindset was. And uh, I love the way he doesn't answer, right? You won't answer me, I won't answer you. I just love like, it. You won't answer me. All right, and then the parable of the tenants. What's the significance again of the parable of the tenants? They keep saying, who, who's, who's the owner of the vineyard? God. Who are these people he keeps sending? Prophets, exactly. Prophets, teachers of the law, have been sent over and over and over again. Were any of them uh, beaten up? Were any of them killed? Surprisingly, not as many killed as you might think, but there were those killed. So they were killed, and so they think, well, I'll send my son. Who's he talking about? He talking about Jesus. And what do they do to him? They kill him and throw him out, right? So they think it now belongs to them, right? So the kingdom belongs to them. <laughs> what happens next is only about 40 years later, they're all dead and the kingdom is taken away from them. Jerusalem is destroyed. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I love this uh, passage, the, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Y'all know that comes from a, a, a literal thing that happened about the temple when they built it, according to Solomon's, uh, well, actually David's uh, drawings. And because they started with the with the paper, their drawings, they started with the stones that were on top, and they started making those first. So they sent the ones from the top first. So the corner, the chief of the cornerstone is the one that goes from one corner to another, or at least holds down the corner at the top of the building. It's not the foundation stone. That's not this text. That may be talked in another text, but that text is about that. It's talking about the chief of the cornerstone. And so that's a corner top stone. And that's the reason it was in the way, it got in everybody's way, and it kept pushing and pushing off down the hill. And finally, when they got ready for it, they couldn't find it. It was down there in the weeds. All right. Um, 
paying the imperial tax. What's the significance? Come on. Was it wrong to pay taxes to an immoral government? <laughs> if it is, we probably should never pay taxes again. <laughs> I mean, do you think the government always does the right thing in America? You haven't paid attention, right? So, no. So, was Jesus against paying taxes? No. Uh, what was he really for? What What was the message he was writing? You should focus on God. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. It's talked about in Romans chapter 13. Sometimes governments are bad, but no government at all is far worse. Even the corrupt ones have some form of keeping peace and some stability. Sure. Absolutely. Without, without police force, without military, you're subject to roving bands of criminals that you don't have enough manpower to stop if you're a man living at home by yourself. That's just the way it is. There's nothing to do about that. But that didn't answer my question. <laughs> my question is, is, what was the significance of, why did he need the coin? It says, it says, what's the limit of the I think it showed the priority of where your mind should be at. You know, they, they were worried about Caesar, giving money to Caesar. And Jesus is saying, that shouldn't really be your priority. The priority should be to worry about what, what God really wants you to do. Don't worry about Caesar if you're not. I think you're right, but I want to follow this line of thinking. What was on the, what was the image? Caesar. So, who bears the image of Caesar other than the coin, right? What image do you bear? In the image of God. So if the coin who bore his image can be given, what does this to God. They didn't miss that. They understood that completely. We kind of miss it. That's the significance. So if you think that physical things are going to really make you right with God, you kind of think there is one physical thing that matters. That's you and what you do with God and, and putting God first. Absolutely. All right. Um, all right. So that's paying Caesar's tax. We're already in to 12. You don't know where we are. We're now on uh, marriage to resurrection. Um, this is a Leverite law. You don't know this law, right? A Leverite law. It's actually old, and it may actually predate the scriptures. It appears that that might have been going on before we have the Old Testament law. Okay, because we get indications that that was happening before Moses, right? And Moses writes about it. So in Leverite law, the idea was you didn't want a woman left in this world without some means of support, right? And so it wasn't so much about marrying the girl as it was about she didn't have any children by that man. And we need to make sure she has a child so that that child will take care of her in her older age, right? And usually, not always, Usually, when a man child was born to this woman after you've married, uh, then that man child would take on the name of the father. And then that would be pretty much the relationship responsibility that the man has, except to take care of her. The idea wasn't for her to just have poodles of children, that wasn't the idea. The idea was that she needed a man child to take care of her. So that's the letter I lost. These seven had been married to her, and none of them had any boys, right? So, uh, she's scared. All the brothers died and were married to her. <laughs> oh, that's the story I was like, oh my God. Oh yeah, you want seven men married her and they all died. I'm like, okay, you better watch what you're drinking in her. <laughs> So, but you got to admit, Jesus does such a wonderful job of dealing with this. And so, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. 
you know, God's not the God of the dead, but of the living, and he makes it, that's such a good point, right? But it, it's kind of got a multi-level meaning, likely. So one of the elements is, is straightforward, honest, straight up, I am, right? Is present, active, and Abraham's been dead at the burning bush. He's been dead for, what, 400 years, right? Something like that, about 400 years, about 500 years. He's been dead, and Isaac's been dead 200 years, and Jacob's been dead 100 years, maybe. And so those guys are dead, and yet he says, I am, right? Okay. This also may be a Hebrewism, okay, that the Sadducees had taught. And their Hebrewism would have been, God is not the God of the left dead, but of the living. So it may have been a saying that they used all the time because they didn't believe in the resurrection. So it sounds like he's quoting something here. This doesn't even, it almost doesn't sound like something Jesus would say. You know what I mean? So it's like he's quoting something here. So it, it may have the first meaning we've already looked at. It may have a Hebraism of kind of, this is what you guys say, and now you realize it just came back to bite you. But there's one other thing. And they're, they're, it's kind of under the surface you might not have picked up on, and that is he's talking about them. God's not your God, because you're the dead. You're the spiritual dead. And you're right. He's not the God of the dead. Yeah, that's the scary undertone, isn't it? <laughs> That's the part of that nobody wanted to hear. Here. All right, so we're on the Great Commandments. Huh? This guy seems to be pretty sincere, doesn't he? This guy had asked this question. Yeah. What? The time is wrong. The time is wrong. Oh, we're through this one. I love all of that. <laughs> Did y'all know we were going to meet up there? No, sir. All right, so anybody got a comment to make on um, any of this? Because we haven't covered nothing. Anything? Yes? You know, what I see as a whole, whenever I see the Gospels, is the fact when I talk to atheists, you know, it becomes, I mean, before I used to not really believe in the Bible, but when I read the Gospel, you, you got to understand the fact that when people write a book, they even write it in favor of themselves, they have a motive for why they're writing that book for the people, for the religion, for the call. To make money. Yeah, and so the one thing that persuaded me that the Bible was real was the Gospels, because I'm thinking if the Jews, if the Bible isn't real, then that means the Jews wrote it. And if the Jews didn't write it, then that means that the Gentiles wrote it. But they're both making each other look bad. So why would somebody write a book? A fictitious book that then makes themselves look bad. And that, that's how I kind of won some people over Christ because I showed them, I said, well, if you think the Bible, the gospel isn't real, then that means somebody made it up. And who made it up? Well, the Jews made it up. Well, then why would they make themselves look bad? They, they, they gave up Jesus. They did this, they did this. If somebody was going to write a book, a false book, then that would make themselves look bad. Don't you love the Bible because it just tells us all about everybody's works? Yeah. <laughs> I love that and that just means how much more I believe it and by the way the fact that Matthew, Mark, Luke and John even though they're almost identical they're not perfectly identical and you may worry about the fact that they're not perfectly identical the fact that they're not perfectly identical is the reason I believe it that's why I believe this is from real witnesses they wrote this up. anyway we're way over let's have a quick prayer Holy Father, we pray that you'll bless these people, help them to be safe as they depart this place, and may we always believe your word and trust it, and may we truly understand who Jesus is and what you wanted to do through him in your kingdom. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless you.